فاشرف بي لاشتغال بالعلم ولا تبغي به ما عشت يا ذا بدلا ويا له من شرف عظيم The other thing is ويعتقد كمال أهليتي ورجحانه على طبقتي You also need to know that your teacher is more capable than all his peers That's what you need to believe as a teacher That my teacher is far greater than his peers Those, that's what I believe That's what a student of knowledge should believe regarding his teacher He shouldn't say, oh teacher, so and so I think is better than you He should not say that But he should believe that the teacher he's taking from is greater than the rest The reason why? Because that's the closest for you to benefit from him. If you believe in your heart, there's somebody out there that I know who's better than my teacher. Are you going to benefit fully from your teacher? No, you're not. But once you believe that your teacher is the one who knows it all, huh? he knows it better than his peers, you're going to fully benefit from him and take what he has to offer. All of this is for your own self. It's for you to actually trust your teacher, open up to your teacher. Okay? Some of those who came before us would offer something in charity on their way to their teachers. So look at the Salaf. They used to go out before they come to the Halaqah. They would go on their way. They would give charity on the way on behalf of their teacher. And they would make this dua. Tasaddaq. Tasaddaq bi shay'in. He will give something in charity before he comes to the gathering, before he comes to gain knowledge from his teacher. On the way to the class, the student, what he would do is, um, he would pay a, uh, he would give sadaqah on the way, and he would say this dua. What would he say? And they would supplicate, saying, "O oh Allah, do not disclose their shortcomings to me, and do not take away the blessings of their knowledge from me." This is what they would say. They'll say, "Allah, bastur aiba mu'allimi anni, wa la tudhib barakat ilmihi minni." O oh Allah. Cover from me, veil from me the shortcomings and the mistakes of my teacher. Don't show that to me. And oh Allah, don't take away from me the blessings of his knowledge, that which he has. Don't take it away from me. Imagine the one who's going out of his way. He's looking for his teacher's mistakes. He's actually looking for his teacher's mistake. Really? Let's verify that. Did he say that? Okay, let's verify that. Everything that the teacher says, you go out of your way, you want to verify it about him about him so you can what so you can have something against him the salaf hadi al ummah they would ask allah not to show them they would ask allah to protect them from it they would turn a blind eye towards their teacher even if they saw something they would say i didn't see it they didn't want to know any of that imagine the one who spreads and goes out and even posts and tweets and comments the shortcomings of his teacher what khair do you await in this dunya لأن, as I said before to you, the one who is teaching you, the person you're taking knowledge from, is a person who is inherited whose position? The Prophet's position. And this is the way you deal with a person who's inherited the Prophet's the Prophet's knowledge. Is this how you deal with a person who is who is sitting in the position of the Messenger? And I said this before to you that the scholar and the person of knowledge, the thing that they inherit is not just knowledge, they also inherit the respect that the prophets are given, they inherit part of that. The scholars and the people of knowledge and your teachers, what they inherit as well is the respect that you would give to the prophet, you give it to them as well. Ta'zeem, and ijlal, and honor, they gain that as well. Now. The companion of the companion of Imam Al-Shafi'i. Here, Rabi'i is Rabi'i ibn Sulaiman al Rabi ibn Sulaiman al Muradi, who is Sahib al Shafi'i, Tilmid al Shafi'i. He was a student of Imam al Shafi'i, and he's the one who narrated the Kitab al Umm from Imam al Shafi'i. He, Rahimahumullah Ta'ala, he said, May Allah have mercy upon Rabi ibn Sulaiman al Muradi and al Imam al Shafi'i, both of them. He said the following May Allah have mercy on both of them. One said, I never had the courage to drink even a sip of water in the presence of Imam al Shafi'i in, in veneration of him. Allahu Akbar. Some narrations they mention, مَا تَصَفَّحْتُ ورقة. I never turned over a page. Some other narrations mention that. I never turned a page over in the presence of an Imam Shafi'i. I never did that. هَيْبَةً لَهُ In veneration, respect, glorifying, honoring him. رَحِمَهُ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى I never. And here he's saying, I never drank a water in front of Imam Shafi'i. أَبَدًا 
Imagine a student that comes in front of his teacher, kisses his teeth, talks back at his teacher, says to his teacher, wow, really? Forget that. Questions his teacher's statements, questions his teacher. Really, what's the validity of this? Khaba wa khasir. Khaba wa khasir. That person has become destroyed fi dunya wal akhirah. He has. It was transmitted. It was transmitted from Al Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu that he said, Man alamani harfan sirtu lahu abda. And anyone who teaches me a letter, letter, I will be a slave for them. Meaning, I will be enslaved to that person. They will kind of own me now. Respect and honor. Nukil. Some scholars then did i'tirad of that statement. They didn't accept it. A slave here doesn't mean the slavery of Allah. It means slave as in like the way you, your master tells his slave what to do. My point here is that the status of the person who teaches you is something that has become very little in the eyes of students of knowledge. They learn four or five masail after their teacher and they genuinely think. And a lot of the times if you look at them, they still don't know more than their own teacher. They still don't, wallahi. I was recently told one of the mashayikh in Somalia some of his students graduated from Medina University. They went and they graduated from Medina University. And the teacher, their teacher is one of the most, most knowledgeable scholars in the country. So they went, they came back and they resided in the same place as him, of course. And now what they're saying is that he doesn't know we know, because they're graduates from the University of Medina. So they opened an institute right next to his one, and they're teaching. But wallahi wa billahi wa tallahi, I say by Allah's name, he's still more knowledgeable than them. Even though they're still graduated. That just shows you what? Arrogance. Conceit. Be full of yourself. You st like, these people are going to be mahroom of knowledge. Knowledge is going to be protected from it. And I've seen, genuinely speaking, I say this with all honesty. And when I say this, this is not a consistent blame at everybody. Who, but generally speaking, people who graduate from prestigious universities are the ones who are filled with arrogance. Sarahatan. And if you look at a lot of them, هُمْ أَقَلُّ عِلْمًا They have the least knowledge. They have the least knowledge. The ones who graduate from universities. They have, and they genuinely do, have less knowledge. Than the ones who've what? who studied the most the classic way. Who sat with the mashayikh and the ulama and took knowledge from them. Um, so humbleness is needed. The person who taught you is always somebody you honor and you respect. Even if you differ with them on a mas'ala, you always respect them. You always respect them. The leader of the faithful, Ali ibn Abi Talib, may Allah be pleased with him, said, Among the rights of a scholar over you, the students, is that upon coming to a lesson, you should, you should greet him in person while greeting everyone else in general. You should sit in front of him and never point with your hand in his presence. The author here now mentions Ali ibn Abi Talib, he thinks that he said that the right of the scholar is I mean, here he means teacher, of course. Is and to send him ala nasi amma. That the rest of the people you say, Salaamu alaykum, generally. But the teacher, you don't do that. He's not like the rest of the people. You come and you give him salams. That's him. Okay. Wa an tajlis amamah. As for the teacher, you don't sit on his corners. You always sit in front of him. That's another one. Wa la tushiranna inda kabiyadik. Don't point at him. You don't do that. Uh, yeah. You must not wink at anyone or make similar gestures, nor tell your teacher that such and such person has said something contrary to Don't in the teacher's gathering and you don't wink. You don't go like that in front of your teacher. Sometimes some people what would take that statement as well is laugh in front of your teacher. He says something. You find conferences that you go to, the Mashaykh they make a joke. And what do you find when the mashayikh make a joke? Some people are laughing. It's Su'ul Adam. Why are you laughing for? It's bad manners. It's truly bad manners when the sheikh is talking, when the mashayikh come, winking in front of the sheikh. He will think you're talking about him. They think it's something that you said, something he said you're laughing about. You see, it's not good. Don't say to your teacher, so and so said, different to what you said. You come to your teacher and you say, oh, you said that. Well, I, another sheikh I went to or another person I know said different to what you said. Don't say that to him. Don't oppose your teacher. Don't say Fulan opposes you in this. 
Don't say Allah opposes you in this. Don't say that to them. No. Do you not backbite anyone in front of him? Don't backbite anyone in front of him. Don't say, oh, it's Fulani, is this. That's disrespecting him. No. No consult with anyone else in his presence. Don't speak to other students and, and you consult them and you take their advice on board when he's there. No, you don't. Do you do tayammum when you have water? But the teacher is the water and the students are the tayammum. When the teacher is absent, within yourselves you can consult one another. But if the teacher is there, then you take it from him. Why are you going to go to the students? Disrespecting him again. Do not grab his garment when he stands up, appealing for him to wait. Some people, they grab the teacher. Teacher, can I talk to you? Or disrespectfully put their, shoulder, their hand on your shoulder, grabbing you from the shoulder. You don't touch the teacher. You never ever touch, you never place a finger on the teacher. Who gave you the rights to touch your teacher? He'll touch you, put his hand on you, grab you by the shoulder, put his hand on your, his, your head to the teacher. All of those are su'ul adab. One brother told me one time, um, Shah Abdul Rashid Ali Sufi came, and one of the kids, what he did was, he wanted to do a picture with the Sheikh. And what he did was, he grabbed him by the shoulder. <laughs> Like a friend, you know, just like a friend. He put his hand, hand over the sheikh, like, and he says, Sheikh, come close, let's take the picture. Huh? Those people should get beaten with, yeah? they should get lashed. Who gave you the right to put your hand on the sheikh? Huh? All of these are bad manners that you see manifest in many of us. We don't tend to see, see, see the seriousness of it. You see, don't grab his garment. Nor should, uh, nor should you insist that he teaches if he becomes tired. You see the teacher sleeping, he's tired, he's finished, he's taught you as much as he could. Don't persist on him after you saw he's tired. This is disrespecting him again. If he does i'dhar and says, I can't do it like that, don't push him to it. If he says, I don't want to do that, what about this, what about this, what about this, it's annoying, don't do that. If he becomes lazy and tired from doing something, do not do ilhah. Ilhah means you persistently go on to him too much. Now. And do not allow yourself to grow tired or bored of his continued con uh, companionship. Don't say to your teacher, oh, I can't be bothered, to, I can't hang around with him today, I can't be bothered, I don't want to. La, do not give up on that. Wala never turn away from and from your teacher. The lengthy companionship of his. Lizalika is one of the reasons no, uh, Shafi'i mentions. My brother, you're not going to attain knowledge unless you take six steps. And from them is the companionship of a teacher. So you never get tired of that. Never get tired and say, Oh, I saw him yesterday. I don't want to see him today. Don't worry. I'm not going to meet him. Don't. Never get tired of his companionship. All of these are respect of the student towards the teacher. No. A student should indeed strive to adorn himself with the qualities pointed out by Ali ibn Abi Talib. May Allah be pleased with him. He should defend his teacher upon hearing others backbite him. And if he is unable to do that, he should leave the gathering where this is taking place. He should come to his sheikh bearing all the above qualities as well as the qualities referred to with regards to the teacher in the previous segment. He should, therefore, be in a state of ritual purity, having used the miswak, and should free his heart of everything that may distract him. The author here, Rahimallah, he mentions All of those points that we mentioned were all Ali's statements. A student of knowledge needs to come with those statements from Ali ibn Abi Talib. He needs to adorn himself with it. He needs to come with those characteristics. Another thing he mentions, that if your teacher has been backbiting in the gathering where you're at, you should always defend him. And defend the statements that are said against him. It's a right that he has on you. If anybody tries to speak about him, if anybody says anything about him, always there to defend him. Never will I take that from you. No, my teacher is not that. I don't accept that. وَأَيَّرُدَّ غِيبَةَ الشَّيْخِ إِنْ قَدِرَ لذلك الرسول صلى الله عليه وسلم يقول من ذب عن عرض أخي 
Anyone who defects the honor of his brother or sister, Allah will defend your honor the day of judgment. Your honor will be defended and it will be protected the day of judgment. That's just a normal Muslim person. فَمَبَالُكَ What do you then think the person who has minna on you after your parents? What did your parents give you brothers and sisters? The scholars, they say that the teacher is of the menzila of your parents. You know why? The reason is because your parents gave you the worldly life and this one gave you the hereafter life. You're living in this world because of your parents bringing you to this world. You, know, you live, you breathe because of them. But the revelation is a, it's a soul, it's a life. He gave you that other life. So he has on you minna that you don't ever forget. A right that he has on you. That you consistently remember. So whenever you're in a gathering, a person who favored you, a person who honored you, how dare does somebody backbite you, backbite him in front of you, and you're silent about it, or even you're in consent with it, or even you propagate it, or even you bring it up. Khabu wa khasir. If you're not able to speak to these people because they're ignorant so much and they're stubborn, and they're stubborn, and they're arrogant and hard-headed, then just what did he say? Farakadalik al majlis. Say I'm not going to sit in this gathering anymore. You guys are backbiting my teacher, I'm going to leave the gathering. I'm, no one, I'm not going to, as they say, I'm not going to entertain in any way, form or shape this kind of gathering. I am not. Okay? It's hypocrisy. That yesterday you were backbiting your teacher and then tomorrow you want to come to his gathering and you want to take knowledge from him. That is what? Hypocrisy. And remember what you do is what you will get in this world. Al-jaza'u min jinsi al-amal. This same person who's got the audacity to talk to you about your teacher, remember they are doing the same about you. Not very far will they do that. They will be doing the same very soon to you as well. So you're only benefiting yourself in this regard. Then the author, rahimahullah, he talks about adab, the etiquette of entering into the gathering of knowledge. He said, When you come to your teacher in his gatherings, you come to him in that gathering with complete characteristics. Just like we mentioned for the teacher, you come clean, pure, no dirty socks, smelling socks, the whole masjid is all, what is this, a'udhu billah, you don't come uh, to the halaqa or the circle with your breath smelling, kicking, huh? Use Colgate, Aquafresh, Mac Cleans, there's different varieties, use them, Tic Tac, use something. Smell nice when you come to the gathering, don't your clothing. When the teacher comes to you, you, you smell nice. So when he comes close to you, you ask him a question. Okay, sometimes some students, they'll come up to you and their breath is not smelling nice. It's very... And he says, I have four questions. They're like, no, just have one. Just ask one question. Even that one question, you want it to be so fast. If he asks you, say, layjus, layjus, quickly, it's not permissible, we'll carry on next one. Barakallah that is harmful for the teacher, it's disrespectful to the teacher. Because that same person, if he was going to go to a wedding, what would he have done? Mm, you see? So that's all disrespecting the teacher. You're not giving him the rights that he deserves. If you were going to an amazing place, uh, if you were going to a... You would, dress, you would dress up. Trust me, everybody has one thing, a moment where they dress up. This is something that they need to do when they come to the teacher's gathering. مُتَطَحِّرًا مُسْتَعْمِلًا السِّوَاكِ Use your siwak. Your yeah, toothbrush is, is, is enough. Siwak is a sunnah though. Cleanse your heart, just like for the t-shirt, also the student. When you're coming to the gathering, get clothes of everything else. Come to this gathering, open-minded, you're not going to engage in anything else. Don't just come walking into the teacher's room. Knock the door and take permission so you can come in. That's what he says. Also, when you do come in, you don't give salam to everybody. Disrespect. You come in, you give salam to everyone. Hey, you're late. Sit down. Some people come in, and when they come in, they want to be known that they walked in. They just have that persona where they want people to realize their entrance. You're late. There's nothing to show off by this. You, when you come in, you specify the salam with the teacher and you sit down. When he leaves the gathering, what do you do? You give salams to the teacher specifically and the rest of the people you say salam alaikum and you walk away. He should also, he should also give salam for leaving the gathering and uh, this is referred to in the hadith that says the first salam is none 
the more worthy of being given than the last. So the person when he leaves the gathering, he should also do the leaving one. Because of the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu which is that the first salams is not more befitting than the second. I mean, when you did come and you said one, right? That salams is not justifiable for your second salams. In other words, both of them are as important as each other. You say salam alaikum when you come in, and you say salam alaikum when you leave. Now. He should not walk over others in order to sit at the front. Instead, he should sit at the last row or outer circle, unless the sheikh tells him to come forward, or if he knows that the students normally give him preference over themselves. If the student comes late, then he has no right to break the people's necks and move come and walks in and he wants to take the first spot, yeah? Like he's done. That shouldn't be the case. Rather, he sits where, he's, where he finds a space. That's where, that's where he sits. Except though, if the teacher says to him, come forward. If the teacher says to him, come sit next to me, you specifically come sit here. Because the teacher, for some reason, wants him to be here, then he does. Or, if he knows that the student always leaves a spot for him. And that's always the case, then that's not an issue, he can. Now. He should not ask anyone to give up his place for him, and if someone were to give him preference over himself in this regard, he should not accept it, as this was, uh, as this was the example set by Ibn Umar. May Allah be pleased with him. Also, the author here mentions is that He shouldn't get he shouldn't tell somebody get up for me. I really want you to get up for me from this particular place that you're at. No, don't. Okay? He comes and says, Oh, yesterday I was sitting here. So please can you get up? He can't. If this person sees you and then somehow feels like, oh I'll get up for you, then he shouldn't accept it. He said, Iqtida'am bibn Umar. This is in accordance to Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala. Uh, that this was the example which he set and this example is found in Tirmidhi and Ahmed it is Muslim based on the hadith of the Prophet where he said La min majlisi thumma yajlisu fi. that one of you should not make your brother or your sister stand up for you in a seat get up for me this is my place. get up he should not do that and then when he pushes takes him away he, he sits in that spot he should not do that then Sali Mawla ibn Umar, he said, فَكَانَ الرَّجُلُ يَقُومُ لِبْنُ عُمَرٍ فَلَا يَجْلِسُ فِيهِ So Abdullah ibn Umar sometimes used to come and people would see him because this is Ibn Umar, right? Ibn Umar would not tell them to get up for him. They would just see him from far and they would get up for him. Abdullah ibn Umar would not sit. And he would not take it. And he would walk away from it. However, if there is benefit to this or if the teacher orders this, then it, then it is acceptable that a student give up his place to someone else. The author here now talks about if this particular individual, okay, if this particular individual, him coming forward, there is a great benefit in it. There's a great benefit in it. Or if the teacher commands him to do so, he should never sit in the middle of this gathering unless there's a necessity for that. He should, he should not sit in the midst of a circle unless it is necessary and should not sit between two companions without their permission. If, however, they make room for him, he should sit down between them and fold his legs as to not take up too much space. Now, if you come, don't try, you see two people that are together, don't sit in the middle of them. You should never sit in between two individuals except with their permission. If they choose to give you space, then you can sit. And then even then, you tuck yourself in. You let yourself out and just relax and you spread yourself out. You keep yourself, all, yourself, yourself together. That being known that two people are together, when you do cause that to them, it causes enmity and hate in the gathering. Okay? So you don't want to have that in the gathering. He should behave well with his peers as well as others attending the assembly as this is considered respect for the teacher and preserving order in his class. He should sit before the sheikh in the class. He should sit before the sheikh in the manner of a student and not that, and not that of a teacher and speak in a lowered voice unless it is necessary that he raise his voice. He should not fidget with his hands or anything else as, uh, and he should not look around without due reason. Rather, he should turn himself towards the sheikh with full attention. 
The author here talks about adab al-talib al-ilmi ma'a rufaqaihi. When it comes to your friends and your colleagues, the author here says, وَيَنْبَغِي أَيْضًا أَيْ يَتَأَدَّبَ مَعَ رُفْقَتِهِ You should be very well mannered with your colleagues and those who are present in the gathering of the Shaykh. Because having good manners with your colleagues and having good manners with those you're sitting in the gathering with is actually good manners with your teacher. And it's respecting his gathering. وَيَقْعُدَ بَيْنَ يَدَيِ الشَّيْخِ قِعْدَةَ الْمُتَعَلِّمِينَ and the student sits in front of the teacher, the sit of a student of knowledge. And he doesn't sit like a teacher. Like you don't sit as a teacher in the sense where you are the individual who sits the highest. And you, you. Imam al Nasa'i, his teacher Ahmed ibn Salih, I had, I read, he kicked him, Imam al Nasa'i, out of the gathering. He kicked him out. Ahmed ibn Salih kicked him out, al Misri. The reason why he kicked him out was because the Sa'i was a man who used to love to dress. And he used to dress very well. And he used to look very profound in his gathering. So he told him, get out of my gathering. I never want to see you here again. And of course something must have triggered that off. The teacher told him, leave. So the Sa'i was kicked out of that gathering. So he used to go behind the wall and he used to narrate from there. He never stopped learning. But an Imam al Nasa'i, because of something that was in his heart towards Ahmad ibn Salih, any reason he could find to critique him, he wanted to. He found something on another Ahmad ibn Salih, who was not Ahmad ibn Salih, his teacher, it was another one. And because something was in his heart, he didn't verify which of the two it was. So he jumped the gun and he criticized and critiqued Ahmad ibn Salih. This is something that entered in Nasa'i's heart towards his teacher. The point here though is that the student sits in the gathering with humility, humbleness, dresses and acts like a student. If his sheikh, for example, wears a bisht, huh? those things that Saudi, Saudi wear. Saudi, that thing that they wear, you see that big thing over the shibah, right? you guys know it, right? That big thing that they wear on top of the thobe. That is genuinely worn by the scholars and the leaders of the country. That Dullab al ilm don't wear that. Students of knowledge don't wear that. So for a student of knowledge to wear that in the halaq of the sheikh is something bad. Because that's worn by the sheikh by alone, he wears that. So if it, within the custom, if there's something like that within the custom, we don't have something like that, do we? Something that's unique for the teacher. Do we? Huh? A chair, okay, that's good. Chair and a table is the teachers. Generally, students mute should all sit on the floor then. Nah, but is there something wearing that we think that it's only for the sheikh? No one else wears it. Huh? Some places the imam. Some places. Some places the imam. The imam would even. The imam. Yeah, yeah. So sah the imam and the shimar. Uh, yeah. Things like that. In the Arabic language, the word imam they use it as a turban. Turban is imam of them. This is called the shimar. Yeah, the one they do like that shema and the, the bish that they wear on top of it that thing they wear on it that is genuinely for the scholars that's a, genuinely for who? the scholars ulama wear that so when you see somebody wearing that in Saudi Arabia they, in the Kaaba I remember I wore it once in my life I got it from a shop so I just wanted to check it out so I went to the haram with it Ooh, just checking it out if I look all good in it and then they kept coming up to me and they asked me questions in the Kaaba People started coming up to me, asking me questions. You know, I did this in the Haram. What do you think is it jaiz? Is it, ooh. I folded that up quick, took the bish off. Everything, I put it in my, because they come up to you thinking you're a scholar and they start asking you questions. It was good though, like in, that when I wore that, they thought I was the guard of the Kaaba. You see, so I could go into places where, like other people are told, turn, go, go, step, go, go that way. I was relaxing with the uh, Aimat al-Haram, not with them, but I could, I could do things, I could get away with things that normal people couldn't. So just give you guys a tip if you guys want to take that on board. You should not read to the Sheikh while the Sheikh is busy or irritable or in a state of grief or sorrow. Or so the author here, sorry, I never finished the point. He says, وَلَا يَرْفَعُ الصَّوْتُ رَفْعًا بَلِيغًا مِنْ غَيْرِ حَاجَةٍ Don't raise your voice in front of your teacher, ever. Shout loud, say something loud, never. Don't ever do that. Okay. Don't laugh in your teacher's gathering. Don't even increase in speech. 
okay, without no need. So if he says something, like for example, you want to ask a question, some people love to go in with their question. Just ask the question with the most summarized speech. Some people say, okay, let me, you know, I'll start from the beginning. I'll start from the beginning. Basic, what it was is on the 12th of September, 19, and they go in and they run you for a background check. The teacher does not care of all of that. Just ask the question. Fact. But because the teacher was told before, have be kind to your student, don't cut them off. So you're yeah, just going to have to listen. Hey, yeah. mm -hmm. 20 minutes went by, okay. Mm -hmm. So he's just going to listen to all of that. In reality, that's incorrect. The student should fast. Sheikh, basically my question is, is, if a person is in this situation, what is the ruling regarding the CFS? And the teacher, he answers the question. So the student doesn't go off topic and speak too much. He also doesn't play with his fingers and he doesn't play with any of that. Also, when you're studying with your teacher, this thing that people keep doing this all the time, looking right, left, turning away your vision from the teacher is also bad manners. Consistently look at him. When you're noting something down, look at him. Noting something down, look at him. Noting something down, look at him. Right and left, you only look at at times of necessity. Only times of necessity. When it was narrated from Hisham ibn Ammar, he came to Imam Malik rahimahullah. He came to Imam Malik. And in the city of Medina, an elephant came. And you know, the Arabs have never seen elephants. Indians, you guys have seen it, right? Yeah, you guys got elephants. Some people have never ever in their life seen an elephant. Have I ever seen an elephant? Yeah, when I was a kid, I went to the London Zoo. They've got it there, yeah, that's where I saw it. Yeah, I was going to cry. So in the Arab world, there's no such thing as an elephant. The animal's never been seen before. Of course, Abraha came to destroy the Kaaba with it. But majority of them don't know how an elephant looks like. So in Imam Malik's time, an elephant came. So they all ran to it. They wanted to see this animal. They rushed and they ran. Hisham ibn Ammar stayed with Imam Malik. He, did not walk. he didn't even look back. He just stayed, consistent look at Imam Malik and sitting with him. And Imam Malik said to him, why don't you go? People are running. He said, I didn't leave my family because of that. I never left my land to see elephants and came to take knowledge from you. He preferred looking at Imam Malik and looking at Imam Malik, the way he carries himself and the way Imam Malik is, than to see an animal he's never seen. What will that do to a teacher when he sees that from you? That nabaha. He's going to open knowledge up for you. He's going to be how serious you are. And he's going to give you a lot. Sahih. He will. He will. وَلَا يَلْتَفِتُ يَمِينَ وَلَا شِمَانِ لِغَيْرِ حَاجِ بَلْ يَكُونُ مُتَوَجِّحًا لِلشَّيْقٍ مُصْغِيًا إِلَى كَلَامِهِ Even if your teacher tells you something you've already heard of. Sometimes the teacher might repeat the same point again and again. Okay? He might tell you the same story. He might even crack the same joke. صح? You, you laugh like it was the first time. <laughs> okay, mashallah. You know your parents sometimes they tell you the same joke all the time. Or they tell you the same story all the time. Well, you pretend like it was the first time. Really? SubhanAllah, Abi. Wow. 112. <laughs> who, who goes through that? Sees their parents tell them the same story all the time. Yeah, who feels that that happens sometimes to them? Yeah? <laughs> you guys don't? Huh? You feel. What about you, Muhammad? <laughs> Muhammad's mom's here, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Who else? <laughs> we generally all go. The manners is of the son is that he pretends that this is the first time that he's heard this story. He goes, mm, Ajib. Mm. That's it. Like he's fascinated with the story, even if you feel bored. So you listen all the time. That's the same with the teacher. When he tells you something you've heard of before, you just listen to it as though it's the first time. Then the author goes into chapter في اختيار أفضل أوقات الشيخ وفي الصبر على العلم ومما يتأكد لعتنا به أن لا يقرأ على الشيخ في حال شغل قلب الشيخ وملله واستيفازه وغمه وفرحه وجوعه وعطشه ونعاسه وقلقه ونحو ذلك مما يشق عليه أو أو يمنعه من كمال حضور القلب والنشاط 
وأن يغتنم أوقات أوقات نشاط الشيخ ومن آدابي أن يحتمل جفوة الشيخ وسوء خلقه وأن لا يصده ذلك عن ملازمته واعتقاد كماله ويتأول لأفعاله وأقواله التي ظاهرها الفساد تويلات صحيحة فما يعجز فما يعجز عن ذلك إلا قليل التو قليل التوفيق أو عديمه وإذا جف الشيخ ابتدأ هو بالاعتذار إلى الشيخ وأظهر أن الذنب له والعتب عليه فذلك أنفع له في الآخرة والدنيا وأنقى لقلب شيخه له وقد قالوا من لم يصبر على ذل التعلم بقي عمره في عباد في عباية الجهالة ومن صبر عليه آل أمره إلى عز الآخرة والدنيا ومنه ومنه الأثر المشهور عن ابن عباس رضي الله عنهما ذللت طالبا فعززت مطلوبا 